Good day, this is Terry DeFazio and you're watching Dial It Up. Today we have Sharon Campbell, writer, author, etc., etc. She's uh, done quite a bit of writing and probably publishing in her life. And it's good to have her on the show today. And the reason Sharon is on our show is because a month or so ago, Karen, uh, Sharon asked me to be on her show. So I said, well, why not have her on my show? So Terry, how, are you, how are you today? Terry, it's wonderful to be here. Um, it was an honor to have you on Your Kingdom today, but to actually be on Dial It Up is brilliant. Um, you've been in the newspaper and everything, so I couldn't resist this invitation. And I am, as you say, a writer, so I'm all here. Fire away with your questions. Well, first of all, tell us a little bit about yourself. Obviously, you're born, born in the United States. You your, noticed. Your accent just, just gives it away a little Does bit. Does it really? So tell us about you know where you grew up and all that, Sharon, because I think our, our viewers would really like to know about that. Well, thank you, Terry. I grew up in London, and my dad was a musician, mum's a housewife, and I moved to America about eight years ago when I married my husband, who is a retired military gentleman, but I've always loved writing. I worked in the British government for years and years, drawing up statistics and reports, and that gave me a love of looking up uh, details and facts and figures, and I translated that into writing. I loved ghost stories, romantic uh, well, I was going to say horror thrillers that have a romantic twist. Oh. Now, that is interesting because that that's, you know, melding several different styles mm. of, of sorts. So how long have you been writing, Sharon? About 20 years, and um, I, I've even got the calluses on my knuckles to prove it. So <laughs> I started out with a pen and a heavy typewriter. That was back oh, in yeah. the day. But now, of course, we've got keyboards, so it's just so easy to type. Yeah, exactly. I, I don't know where I would... I, I know I learned on an old Adler Selectric... No, it was a, it was a Selectric, and then there was an uh, Adler... Um, uh, electric and you know of course I don't even know if, I don't think anybody makes those anymore do they no they don't make them anymore too, but how fast were you how many words could you produce a minute at max 60 to 65 that's pretty high in high school no that's very good I had I think two or three years of it okay. something like that but all right well I'm up to 120 words a minute on a keyboard but if I had to go back to a typewriter it would be about 20 or 30 hours a real slow plodder mm -hmm. with the keys it, it, uh, it's too bad that the typewriters didn't have autocorrect. <laughs> <laughs> Get that old Tipex out. And, yeah, oh, exactly. It's terrible. Yeah, you have to make erasures or you'd have to put on whiteout or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. So you've been writing for about 20 years. And how many books have you written? Well, I've written four to date. The last two were Island Pond Insights, Island Pond Reflections. Uh, of course, they're about the history of Island Pond up in the Northeast Kingdom there. The book before that was Who Killed Diana, a complete thorough research into the events of the night of um, August the 31st, 1997. Yes, when and tell our viewers what, what's, I mean, I know what that, that means, but can you tell our viewers? Yeah, it's the night Diana, Princess of Wales, died in the Pont d'Arma tunnel in Paris with her um, close friend Dodi Al Faid. And there's always been speculation was it just a high speed accident caused by a chauffeur, Henri Paul, or was she? taken out by the security services. Um, the, the, I, I know that the royal family were concerned at that time about her getting too close and of course Mossad from, from, from the Israeli side would not have looked favorably on her close relationship with uh, Dodi al Faid, who was an Egyptian Muslim. So we'll, we'll never know. But my book really went into the events 
of that day that led up to the tragedy that evening. And my book before that was The Great British Guide to Ghost Hunting and UFOs, which is my secret passion. Now, wasn't there some speculation that that crash was caused by her trying to get away from the paparazzi? Absolutely. She was being chased on bikes. <laughs> the journalists were on motorbikes, and hidden in among those, those paparazzi were Serbian gangsters and, and anyone and everyone was on the woman's back trying to get a story she'd been followed from the moment she and Dodie landed at Le Bourget airport that very morning on their flight from Sardinia so she hadn't had a moment's peace and the paparazzi were just relentless and un, you know merciless. Did anyone get charged in that crash? No no one was charged in the end uh, and the police found that Henri Paul, the chauffeur who actually came from Brittany in southern France, they found that he was drunk and had various pills for depression in his blood. Hmm. That's not a good combination. It is. It Defin was disastrous. De definitely not, because as a former counselor, I can tell you, if hmm. you take antidepressants and drink, they won't work. You'll just keep being depressed. Yeah. <laughs> so... And then mm -hmm. and probably it will make you very, very drowsy also. Yes. So. And plus, you're right about the drowsy aspect, Terry. Henri Paul had been on duty at the Ritz Hotel in Paris, owned by Dodi's father, Mohamed al -Fayed. He'd been there since six that morning. They didn't get in that Mercedes until a couple couple of minutes to midnight. So when they were fleeing down the Corse La Reine, which is the Queen's Road, they should have turned up into the uh, Rue, uh, Rue Charles no, sorry, Rue George V, but some accident, they carried on into the tunnel, and that's where the Mercedes hit the wall. It hmm. was a disaster. Yeah, that was quite tragic. I always liked Princess Diana. Hmm. I, uh, she, she, she seemed to get the, the, the bad end of a lot of deals, didn't she? She really did. She was just, um, you could say, cursed. In fact, the Spencers were a very unlucky family. Oh, is that right? Mm. Mm -hmm. Right from the 16th century. And, of course, I met her brother, Charles, uh, Lord Althrop, and he was an, a nice gentleman, but, of course, he's got a lot of business interests. So I don't think a lot of in, uh, people in England were happy that he had Diana buried on the island right there on the family estate in Norfolk. So it, it proved for a short while to be a great tourist draw. Uh, he put up a museum with her wedding dress, other clothes, and a gift shop, a, a tea shop. But it's died down a little bit now, but we still don't have answers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, it, it's unfortunate you, that you will we'll probably never know everything that went on there. Mm. But uh, I never had a big opinion of the paparazzi, and I have even less of, uh, opinion of them now. Mm. I mean, I don't know. I don't understand what what the uh, attraction is you know being uh, what do we call it, a voyeur you've mm. got to you've got to just pry into people's lives i never got that that's why i never read those tabloids so uh, do you have a publisher no i don't um never had one uh publishers these days seem to only want really big million <coughs> dollar sellers from the likes of stephen king and other really well established authors but anyone who isn't established and doesn't have a big name for themselves has to self-publish self-print and push the books out through um advertising any way that they can oh okay yeah, uh, self-publishing is a lot easier than it used to be, though, isn't it? It is much easier, and I know that Scott Wheeler would say that, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he, he's published several books, and I have, I've published one. You published a, a long, book, the long, great long, Terry, Terry DeFazio. What was, what was the subject? It was my senior thesis at Johnson State. It was about the use and abuse of anabolic steroids. Interesting. And the, uh, I, I brought it to the department, Vermont Department of Health, and they mm -hmm. said, okay, we're going to change the name on the front cover, and we're going to publish it. So it got published by the Department Brilliant. of Health. <laughs> Brilliant. Brilliant. 80, it was 88 pages. That's a pretty good body of work, Terry. Well, that was done in the day when I didn't have the internet. Okay. How did you do your research for that was, book? Um, newspaper articles, magazine mm -hmm. articles. Uh, I think there used to be a thing at libraries called um, InfoTrack. Yep. And you get things on CD-ROMs and things like that. But I would imagine... I mean, you, you've done a lot of research on your books, too, mm. correct? I want to know more about your books on UFOs. 
I want to know exactly. I mean, th- this is fascinating stuff. I mean, I'd, I'd like to know more about how you research that and where you look for information. All right, then. Now, if, if you're writing a book in Britain, a great place for information is Jane's Defense Weekly. It's a magazine. No. Oh. Um, and, and back in the 80s, I rather put my foot in it. There had been a load of reports coming down from Scotland of people reporting UFOs, which had been flying very low and had actually given them radiation burns. Oh. So they were reporting at local hospitals with all these burns. Some of these people actually went on to develop cancer. Well, it was awful. I hadn't meant to expose the American Air Force, but it turned out these people had not been burned by UFOs, but burned by American research flights with the early stealth fighter jet, which was at that time being uh, produced in a small Scottish island called Macrahanish ah. off the, the uh, west coast. So I actually correlated the dates that these people said they saw the UFO or a triangle thing floating overhead, very low, beaming down strong lights that radiated them. And these timings totally matched the flight times of the the stealth which the Americans were experimenting with at the time and of course the stealth fighter jet went on to become a hugely successful part of the war it wars in Iraq and the Middle East so these radiation burns were fairly serious I take very it. serious it led to nausea and all the symptoms of radiation so this mm. is what gave me the clue that you know there was something a little more than a UFO going on other than that I've, I've got true cases of people's experience that can't be brushed away with stealth fighter jets these were people who were actually kidnapped their engines stored they did have missing patches of time and they continue to be visited and um, the more I began to research this the more I, I feel that I began to be targeted and was actually visited by a uh, I, c- I can only call him an extraterrestrial. It was uh, an astounding experience. Now this was in Scotland? Yes, it was in Scotland uh, when I was living in Glasgow. Uh, I had this beautiful Victorian house. And my bedroom was at the front of the house, which had a large bay window, which is a three-sided window. And one night I just woke up and I looked towards the bay window and there was an extra- extraterrestrial who had, for for some reason, um, some kind of breathing apparatus on. I I presumed at the time that they weren't able to breathe our air. Mm -hmm. And um, I said, oh, gosh, what are you doing here? And he said, if we give you any information, I want you to publish it and, and promise that you'll get this information out and that you won't forget this experience. Uh, and of course as much as I was able to Terry I replied oh, I, I won't forget well, what is it that you want me to you know write about and release and he said well we, what we want you to write about is the fact that um, there are going to be wars there's going to be huge conflict up in the future but I want you to know that it's all completely um, manufactured artificially by governments all around the world. They have a doomsday scenario, they're dragging you closer towards it, Mm -hmm. and they have things like uh, different projects and holograms, which they will use to control the masses and manipulate you into fighting against each other. Uh, And the message went on. Well, that seems, uh, that's actually uh, more truth than fiction, because that's, in, in my estimation, that's what governments do. Really? The uh, the old uh, the old saying goes: uh, old men make wars so young men can fight them. Oh yes. And True. whether it's for oil or whether it's for religion or whatever it is, we just can't seem to to stop fighting. And I and I told somebody I was born uh. in 1951. We have been at war with somebody ever since I was born. Yeah. Whether it was Korea, Vietnam, the war on poverty, the war on drugs, Gulf War One, and now the Ira- Iraq and um, yep. Afghanistan. We've just been at war with somebody ever since I've been born. So I, in that particular case, whatever this individual told you mm. was was True. pure common sense as far as I'm concerned. Right, I see. <laughs> he, 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 must, he must have been observing us for a while. Yeah, well, I would say totally. <laughs> yeah. um, it's shocking. 
really awful when you consider the profound implications that if this is true and we are all being manipulated it has to be as you say for oil or money um the twin towers i, I always presumed afterwards that that was a visual manipulation some kind of hallucination i had read a book in britain about 30 years ago and thought nothing of it it was uh just a fiction book where this government and it wasn't the american government had got an empty plane filled it with bodies from all around the world that they'd collected from morgues unclaimed bodies and they'd smashed this plane into a building and of course it was found to have all these dead bodies on and a war started but uh, i never thought i'd see that for real hmm. and then i did you know there's a lot of conspiracy theories about 9-11 and i don't think mm. we'll ever really find out the entire truth which is which is unfortunate. Tell me about your books about uh, Island Pond. Exactly, how did you uh, come up with that? I mean, Island Pond has had over the years has had some you know various phenomenon. Especially, I remember there, w there was a religious cult there at one time yep. that was raided by by the state, which turned out to be I, I, I was told was, it, was, it was pretty it was pretty bogus. Yes. So t tell us about that. Well, interesting. My first book, Island Pond Reflections, didn't touch on the twelve tribes or any of the legal uh, problems with that, which which was an illegal raid, and I know that the children who'd been taken were returned. No. Um, Later, later on, very shortly afterwards. But my book concentrated on the effect and impact of the railroad when it came to Island Pond, it took this little town that had just been a rural farming community and actually brought it to life hugely. Banks moved in, libraries, uh, fraternal organizations. Mm -hmm. There were suddenly stores sprung up to cater to everybody's needs. And the best thing was hotels sprang up because guests would get off the trains, they'd look around the scenic lake, and then they'd need somewhere to eat and sleep and stay. But of course, this led to terrible accidents and tragedies. Well, way uh, men would get run over by the by the trains or squashed on the tracks and of course all this had been written of in the Essex Daily Herald which was a, a great paper at the time it always had something to print so I would find it easy to go to the Chronicles of America online at the Library of Congress find these old stories and pull them out and there were so many stories left over that it enabled me to produce a second book called Island Pond Insights which doesn't focus so much on the tragedies and exciting events but pulls out more information on the characters of course great modern day characters like Gregory Stafford there mm -hmm. who was involved in the 1986 love triangle shooting right there in the middle of Island Pond um, it's, it's a lovely book full of stories about the more more pertinent characters of the town many of whom are alive today mm -hmm. So the railroad, you're saying the railroad really changed all of totally. that? Totally. Okay. Now, how much of that is left over today? I mean, is there, is, is, I, I haven't been to Island Pond since probably since 1995. So uh, is there still a railroad there, or what was the uh, when did it leave and like that? Well, it, it packed up in the 1950s, and all we're left with now is the tracks, which are owned by G G Genesee Railways. Um, a couple of nights a week you'll hear a train coming through but it's carrying toxic waste or some other highly flamm flammable um, thing and nobody's oh, yeah. encouraged to get near it it always travels at night it stops just outside of Island Pond at East Brighton where I actually live oh, and okay. you, you can hear, hear it you know grind into a halt and a few bells and tinkles and you'll see the lights eerily moving through the bushes mm -hmm. um, and you can actually go out onto the bridge and see this and they all of course carry those hazmat signs so that's all I know about what's going on now but we mm -hmm. are left with the beautiful big old railway station which is a bank now and there's a museum on the top floor devoted to the railway mm -hmm. yeah now where is this toxic waste coming from do you know it's coming from Montreal and it's heading straight through through towards Portland. That's all I know. Is there, was is there like a, um, a treatment center in uh, in Portland? Or I, I think there is. I haven't heavily researched this yet, but it will be in book three. Oh, good. I, when, when do you think that might be coming out? I'm going to uh, start working on it now. Of course, we're in, into March, and I hope by August to have enough information to 
maybe get the book finished by December coming. So I would say 2017, the third, final and last book on Island Pond will be published. Well, when you... Right around August or September, mm-hmm. we will have to have you back on the show to talk about it and, and, and the progress on it. I think that would be, I mean, you, you're going to be doing a, a vast amount of research. Yep. And so what sources are you looking at uh, for this? Is it all Internet? or? Uh, it's going to be Internet, old newspapers. Um, I will go over the road here in Newport to the Newport Daily Express buildings where they have everything. Uh, and it's amazing. You can you know, just turn the little microfilm and there are the stories. And Ken Wells, the editor, and of course Ashley Wilkes, the lifestyle editor, they couldn't have been more helpful to me. But what is really interesting about the Newport Daily Express is at the back they have an office full of dusty old newspapers that date back to the 1800s. Newspapers with names that we've forgotten about today that I didn't even know exist. So um, there's a lady out there, Peggy, and uh, she's very kind and lets me go through them. Mm, well, that's good. Now, you, you talked about an Essex newspaper. Yes. I, I'm assuming that is no longer being published, correct? No, it hasn't been published for years. It's the Essex County Herald. The only place that you can find copies of it now are online at Chronicling America, which is the, the, the Library of Congress, and at the uh, Vermont Historical Society in Montpelier. They have a complete library full of microfilms and, and old newspapers. And the, the, the benefit of going there is invaluable. It's absolutely priceless. So I'm delighted that they've kept it. Yeah, um, are they converting any of that microfilm to CD-ROMs or things like that? Not at this present time. Mm-hmm. That would seem like the more logical way to go about it since you can preserve them longer, especially since some of the CDs now that are made of gold, they guarantee oh. for 323 years. Wow, that would be a dream for researchers of the future. Yeah, um, I, can, I can clue you in on some more of that because we, we, ha- we have used it for music and, and or data storage. And, and wow. They, they, uh, I believe they're, they were originally they're made in Japan, mm-hmm. France, or Colorado, and they're guaranteed for over 300 years. And are they really all gold? It's not all gold, but it's like a gold alloy mixed in with it. Be, oh, um, that's so, wonderful. anyways, we'll 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 make sure that you uh, you you you, know, you see that. And if yeah, you want, if you want to, to if you want to ever preserve something of your own on this, uh, I think it would be good. This is basically made for archiving, mm-hmm. which I think is a, a great idea. Yeah, you know. um, have you ever? As a writer, mm. I, I've experienced this with when I've written music, especially. Mm. Have you ever experienced writer's block? Yes, I have. I and how do you, how do you uh, overcome that? Well, it's terrible. What I have to do, if nothing will come to me, and I'm sat there at my computer, I've got all my notes, pens, pencils, and if I've got a story but nothing will come out, what I'll do is get up, I'll take the two dogs for a walk, or else I'll go down to the uh, family dollar store in Island Pond and I'll buy myself a bag of toffees, a bag of jellies, some mints, and I'll chew them and then I'll go back. And generally by that time, a new way of writing the story down will have occurred to me, but it's a really hard thing. I've never been stuck for weeks and weeks like, you know, as I would say, uh, a musician or, or more mm-hmm. experienced authors like you would, but the when it happens it's it's paralyzing well i've only written one book and i'm probably never going to write another one but i did have fun doing it uh especially when you're not using the internet yes it it does make it a bit harder does yeah i I can't imagine how writers like charles dickens or brian aldis who wrote all those great science science fiction books and is a favorite of mine could possibly have written all their books with all the intricate details about different countries and and you know, unusual facts without having had access to the internet but having said that the internet is a great source of misinformation as well many many a time I found myself you know thinking that what's on the internet is completely true and trustworthy and I've written it down and nearly made the mistake of putting it in a book when I found that the internet article is actually wrong so mm-hmm. you've really got to watch out for that it's not the truth that it uh, pertains to be yeah, um, fact-checking is extremely important, yes. isn't it? Yes, and in fact, that's one of the main areas that I slip up in. I, I I, just take it at face value and always remember afterwards, sometimes too late, that I should have done a bit more fact-checking. 
Yeah. And I think with the internet, it's probably easier to fact check, isn't it? Yes. Yes. There, there used to be Alta Vista as a so- source. Uh, of, yeah, of that website's gone. Yeah. It just went, and now of course you're dependent on Yahoo and Google and all the rest. And MSN, yeah. And MSN, and you wonder who owns them, what the real political motivation behind them might be. Mm-hmm. So you've got to be careful. Yeah. Alt- yeah, Alta Vista was a search engine, uh, as was uh, Netscape at one time. Oh, I remember Netscape. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there is one in Europe, though, that I have used on occasion. I found was good. was called Xquick. Now, that's one I've got to look into. I've yeah. never heard of that. W- one of our uh, producers, um, local producers here mm-hmm. that has his own show, says that the, he likes Xquick because he can search for things, and at the end of the day, it's automatically dumped. They wow. don't keep your records. Great. So you can give them a try. Mm. Uh, I was told that they're European. Of course, in, in my opinion, the Europeans have so much that they, they can offer us, and we should be learning from them. Uh, so do you have any favorite authors? I do. I love Brian Aldiss. Um, I must have gone like wildfire through everything that he wrote. And then, of course, there's always Charles Dickens to be revisited time and time again. Uh, when I was a kid, I hated Charles Dickens. But as I got older, I began to appreciate the richness of the, the words and the terminology. And I, uh, you were explaining to me earlier the entomology of, of a certain word that came from Shakespeare in England. Mm-hmm. So I always try to read writers who who are word rich because i think that's very nourishing for the soul and very informative oh yeah i would tend to agree uh i don't not familiar with the first author you said brian yeah brian oldest great science fiction writer oh, okay and then of course in the 1930s in england there was somerset Maugham and evelyn evelyn wall uh, great writers on the social scene. I know that you and your wife are great fans of Danton Abbey. Yes, quite. And if you imagine the rich terminology and script there, well, S- Somerset and Evelyn, they, they just wrote so wonderfully about that particular epoch of, of England where you still had all these Victorian values, but in the 1920s and 30s where people wanted to break out of that and sing, dance, fall in love with whoever they wanted, free of the constraints of of straight-laced Victorian England, which really did carry on for decades after it ended. So these these writers were keen observers, and I think that's what I go for, people with a sharp eye. Yeah, wasn't part of the reason that that era died, wasn't part of it economic, too? Absolutely. And, the war, of course, World War I changed everything. Yep, yeah, it changed everything. It brought women into the factories. Previously, they'd been stuck at home, but now they were valued for their, their impact in, in the workforce. Uh, after World War I, uh, and the same thing happened in World War II, women were expected to pack up their tools and go back to the kitchens, but they refused. And this is how um, women were enabled to vote, get into politics, and of course it gave rise to women leaders like Margaret Thatcher. Yes, and isn't it funny, we were talking about Scotland earlier. Yep. The three major parties in Scotland are all headed by women. And why is this, would you say? Probably because they're good at it. Yeah, really good. Yeah, the uh, the SNP is headed by Nicola Sturgeon. Um, the Labour Party is headed by Kezia Dugdale. And the Conservative Party is headed by Ruth Davidson. That's brilliant. <laughs> I know, it's excellent. It's actually said it's because they're really good at their jobs. And, of course, in Germany, you've got Angela Merkel. Yes, whom I admire quite a bit. Mm, absolutely. And she had a really hard time earlier this week. But um, uh, I was thinking back even to women in Vermont. It, it's strange. Women here were um, emancipated, liberated much earlier than really anywhere else. I was reading through... 100 years ago today in the Essex County Herald, in fact, on the internet last night, and you've got women here who were presidents of companies and Mm -hmm. presidents of organizations, so that always uh, thrills me and pleases me. Yes, with the Scots, I have to admit, it's it's fun to watch them bicker just like the the, the British um, do, because in Britain, Britain, I don't think that there are that that many leaders in Parliament, because I know that the major parties are not headed by by women, but in Scotland, they, they can bicker just as well and i think that's kind of kind of fun i really enjoy that uh we're just about out of time but i want to make sure that we get contact information do you have an email or a website that i can put a graphic up i would be pleased if you would for your viewers terry it's islandpondreflections at yahoo.com 
And that is your email? Yes, it is. Okay. Do you have a website? No, I don't. Never okay. got around to doing that. And um, uh, I always imagine nobody would ever bother to click on it. And uh, I think a lot of my readers are very elderly. They may not be computer savvy, but they certainly like reading about history. So uh, a website is something I need to do next, for okay. sure. I'm I'm uh, interested to see to to I'll be interested to have you back in August to see how you're progressing on this and I want to thank you for being on our show today. It was definitely uh, very informative and I've enjoyed it immensely. Terry, it's been wonderful to be here. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, Sharon, and and to all our viewers out there, this is Terry DeFazio for Dial It Up, saying we'll catch you on the flip side. Have a good day. Mm-hmm.